Hey, Clemson family, let's take a look at the most intense rivalry on the football schedule this year. That's going to be the season ender. We'll see just how much the Tigers can rattle the South Carolina Gamecocks. We're also going to look at a few injury updates that are happening early in fall camp. I'm Daniel Shirley. We'll also take a look at an interesting offer from the Clemson coaching staff this afternoon and close the show with some rumors from practice. I'm Bill Zimmerman. Welcome to episode 14 of the Reign Supreme All Way podcast. We're keeping you on top of Clemson sports. Go ahead and tap that subscribe button so you won't miss any of the big happenings and how we break it down. You can find us on our homepage at ClemsonKickoff.com. We're on Twitter at Clemson Kickoff, and we're on Facebook at Reign Supreme All Way. Plenty of folks are finding us on YouTube, just another place we post our audio, and we are glad you found us wherever you are. So let's get into injuries out of camp. A few things of note lately. Defensive tackle Trey Williams, probably the headline for everything. He had his knee scoped. He is expected to be ready for the season opener. Let's hope he is. He, you know, He's an interesting piece to the puzzle for the Tigers. Obviously not a starter, but he is a guy who they were expecting to play some this year. So that'll be interesting to see if he's if he's ready to go. You hear knee scope and those kinds of things, and you think, oh, how long is that going to take? So you just never know. I mean, I know I had my knee scoped when I was in college, and it took a couple of weeks for me to kind of get back to normal. And I was not nowhere near being a, a well-conditioned athlete that Trey is. So let's hope that it's a smooth transition for him from having the knee scoped to being ready to get back out on the field. I think just climbing the stairs in the student union up to Loja <laughs> was usually a challenge for us, wasn't it? A few yes, other sir. things are pretty minor, although as far as impact on the field, but the largest injury itself would be to freshman defensive back Miles Oliver. He is unfortunately out for the year. Again, roster-wise, most people expected him to register this season. Could cost a little depth back there, but Oliver will not be available this year. That's unfortunate. I think that we kind of knew there was a chance that he was going to redshirt. Dabo even mentioned that there was a pretty good chance that he was likely a redshirt this season. But you never know when you get your chance to get on the field and wh how the, what the impact can be on the team. It sounds like he had had these shoulder problems before in high school, and now they're just going to go in and get them cleaned out and try to make sure that this doesn't happen again and he can move forward with his career. He's a talented young player, and it was going to be interesting to see him when he got his chance to be on the field, but unfortunately we won't get to see that until next year. All right, for the next minute or two, I'm cutting in with a quick solo bonus segment, recording this midday Saturday. The rest of the episode had been recorded Thursday, but some things have happened while we were in the posting process that prompted us to delay. Two unfortunate developments. First one happened Friday with wide receiver Troy Stilato getting hurt in practice. And head coach Dabo Sweeney confirmed today, Saturday, that it's a torn ACL, according to John Blau of the Charleston Post and Courier. So that's going to affect the depth at receiver for the Tigers. And we've been talking about it as a position where several guys are dinged up or recovering. Stilato was recovering himself from hamstring troubles that had kept him out of games last year as a true freshman. And now he's going to miss this season. Perhaps the even bigger story took place Saturday, and this one might be pretty tough. We're going to have to see. But several accounts had star defensive end Xavier Thomas carted out of Death Valley as a scrimmage had been taking place there Saturday. Sounds like an ankle injury or maybe a foot and some conflicting reports on message boards about whether or not he was placing weight on it or even walking a bit. But Thomas took to Twitter with a short post that simply said, quote, Life really isn't fair, man. It really isn't. Close quote. You can understand why he'd feel that way as the standout had surprisingly returned to campus for this season to boost his draft stock. He'd been having a huge camp by many indications. He had lost weight and he was playing great. Now Sweeney didn't mention a name, but did say, according to SI.com, that a player went off the field with a possible rolled ankle. So you hope for some favorable news to come and that the whole year isn't lost for Thomas, but that could take some time for everyone to get to the bottom of. We will keep you posted as needed. We'll give you updates at twitter.com slash Clemson kickoff. We'll be sure to keep things up to date in our next episode early next week. We might even do an emergency pod episode if the situation calls for it. Right now, though, I'll get you back to the rest of this episode. Everything else, I think, is pretty much in no news is good news mode, right? We're not hearing a lot out of Brian Brzee other than he's out there on the practice field uh, Going through drills, we've talked about Adam Randall being out there, but somewhat limited from all indications. Will Taylor is farther along, but he's still working on the finer points. Yeah, those are three names that you look at and say, okay, like you said, no news is good news. That we're not talking about them as far as having hiccup or being pushed back any. 
it is interesting that, you know, you start talking about knee injuries. How long does it take? Well, everybody's body is different and everybody is going to respond differently to the rehab. But it sounds like all three of these young men are in, in really good shape, a really good spot to play this season, obviously, and to have a big impact, especially for Brian, Will coming back from the, the ACL tear last season. They're a little farther out from it than than Adam is. And I mean, Bill, it sounds like all the news is really good on Adam it, and surprising that, since he tore his ACL uh, during the spring. So it sounds like that's we're, we're in a good place with all three of them. Well, let's just hope that continues. I do worry about guys rushing back too soon. And I hope that with the depth that's on this team, especially at defensive tackle and at wide receiver, which is where four out of those five guys are mentioned, they'll take their time. They'll make sure they get it right. They make sure they get set and good to go and full speed before they hit the field. But, but these guys are competitors. It's how they've earned their place on a playoff contender. And we'll just see how well they can do and how soon they're going to be back in action. Remember to follow us on Twitter at Clemson Kickoff in case there are any updates and we'll keep you posted there. But let's get into previewing the South Carolina game this year. This is one that everyone looks forward to at the end of the year. Let's take a peek over the wall. A lot of the optimism in Garnet and Black centers on QB Spencer Rattler coming into Columbia, rejoining his former offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. That's Shane Beamer, the Gamecocks' second-year head coach. Rattler had lost a job in Oklahoma to Caleb Williams because he wasn't taking care of the football. Not a ton of interceptions, but seemingly when he threw a pick, it was a costly one. It was, and there were issues there in Oklahoma with, with Spencer and the offense. I don't think it was all on Spencer. But when you're the quarterback, you you get a lot of the blame when things don't go right. And when he was replaced by Caleb Williams, Caleb played well. And Spencer never could really or never did get the job back. So this move made sense for him. It certainly made sense for South Carolina. I, I don't know that there was a worse team quarterback play than South Carolina last year. I mean, they, they won seven games really without a functioning quarterback. And it was impressive to see what they were able to do with, with that play being so bad at, at such a pivotal position. So we'll see how this marriage comes together and if it works. I know there are a lot of high expectations for him. Uh, there's a lot of excitement for that that fan base, and it makes sense why they're excited. Uh, he's He's been a good player at Oklahoma, even though things didn't work out quite the way he wanted to last year. There is a, you would think, a step up in play with him joining the Gamecocks program. Probably the best quarterback available on the transfer market. I mean, Caleb Williams followed Lincoln Riley out to USC, but I wouldn't say that qualified as really being on the market like he was looking around for another place to go. So Beamer makes a nice addition to the program there. He's entering his second season on the heels of a 7-6 and six debut with the Gamecocks. I don't think it's any secret that he's viewed as quote-unquote their Dabo, but maybe I'd call it more like Dabo Light until he builds a stronger win-loss record. It's going to take time. It is. And, you know, this program has gone through some ups and downs uh, really since Steve Spurrier left. And and you think, okay, well, now we're on level ground and, and the footing is strong and then it just doesn't work out. So uh, they've been heavy into the transfer portal and that makes sense. You're trying to build something quickly and you're trying and, and to do that, you can bring in established players now. Uh, and this wasn't a, an option when you and I were growing up watching college football, and now it's a big part of it. They've been busy in the portal. They brought in Spencer, who we talked about, Austin Stonger, who played tight end with Spencer at Oklahoma, Christian Bill Smith, who was a running back uh, at, at Wake Forest. And then there's an interesting receiver, and then there's an interesting wide receiver transfer who comes in from James Madison, and that's Juice Wells. We'll see if he can add something to the offense as well. So they've been busy in the transfer portal. We'll see how that helps this year's team. Another top target for Rattler should be senior receiver Josh Van, who returns. A couple more running backs they might turn to would be Marshawn Lloyd and Juju McDowell, both of whom look good in the spring game, according to the Greenville News. But the offensive line struggled last year, as evidenced by the 30 to nothing shutout loss to Clemson. And allowed Rattler to be sacked four times in that spring game, even though Rattler only played the first half. That was an issue last year for sure. I, you know, they they didn't play well in that game against Clemson up front. Uh, I don't think anybody played well really in that game offensively for South Carolina. Again, the quarterback issues uh, were on display, and Clemson took advantage of that. So we'll see if they can get those things figured out. Uh, the defense was pretty good last year, Bill. I thought for mo for the most part. 
And I don't think even against Clemson, even though they lost 30 to nothing, I don't think the defense was a huge issue in that game. Clemson just controlled really the entire game from start to finish. So I like what they've done defensively. The defensive front is really good. Clayton White's a good is a good coordinator uh, on that side of the ball. And I think you'll see them continue to improve defensively. I definitely had concerns about facing that Carolina defensive front last fall, but the offensive line did a nice job of making sure that Tigers could put points on the board. Coordinator Clayton White returns to South Carolina for his second year. They had the best passing defense yardage-wise in the SEC last season, but they were 11th of 14 against the run. That left them 7th overall in scoring defense in the SEC. That's not bad. It's not bad, but you're right about the run they struggled. And I think that teams saw that they could take advantage of that, and they did that. And so maybe you didn't see teams try to throw the ball on them as much, and and you saw it in the Clemson game. I mean, Will Shipley had a big game, Kobe Pace had a big game, and the Tigers ran the ball and controlled the line of scrimmage pretty much that whole game. So they've got to get those things figured out if they're going to take the next step. Not that we've been giving out predictions this early in the offseason, but I will say that if I had to predict one here, it would not be as confident as I was last year that Clemson would win this game. I, I think Clemson will win the game. I do. I, I, I you know, am, is it going to be 30 to nothing? I Probably not, because I do think South Carolina has improved. I like what Shane has done with this program. I thought he was a good hire. I know that uh, a lot of people didn't get excited about that hire. It wasn't the sexiest hire in the world, but he's a good coach. He's building a foundation. We're seeing that through the transfer portal. We're seeing it through their recruiting. The recruiting has improved since he's been the head coach as well. We'll just see if they can continue to take that to the next level. But I don't think they're ready to to beat Clemson quite yet. It'll be interesting to see how Clemson closes out the regular season this year with Notre Dame, Miami, and South Carolina, three of the final four games on the slate. That's a fun stretch to end the season. If you're a Clemson fan, you say, we're going to play Miami, Notre Dame, and South Carolina to end the year. I don't know that it gets much better than that for a Clemson fan. So, uh, And two of those games are going to be at home. So that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. And getting South Carolina at home for the first time since the 2018 season it seems even weird to say that, but it's been that long since the Tigers and Gamecocks have played at Memorial Stadium. So it's going to be a lot of a lot of fun. Should be a great end of the year for the Tigers. Don't forget, we've got some great resources and some useful links on our homepage. That's ClemsonKickoff.com. Let's get into a few tidbits to close out the show. One of them is recruiting, and it's a recent decommit from another school that now has a Tigers offer. There was some recruiting news today as we as we record this here on Thursday. Tamarian Parker uh, is a recent Penn State decommit. He had been committed to the Nittany Lions since late June. He decommitted this week, and today he announced a Clemson offer, the number four defensive end in the class. He's a top 50 recruit. If the Tigers could get him in this class, that would be a big-time pickup. So we'll see where this goes, if he's going to take a visit, what's next for him with the Tigers, but at least the coach is giving him an offer today and, and we'll see where it goes from there. Clemson's done a better job in recent years of going into Alabama and getting commits. Parker comes out of Phoenix City, Alabama. It's over near Columbus, Georgia. And some recent players there include wide receiver Justin Ross, wide receiver EJ Williams, and walk-on safety Caleb Nix, who's got a strong football background in his family. He does. His brother is Bo Nix and his father is Patrick Nix, both who played at Auburn. Now Bo is is at Oregon, obviously. I actually covered Caleb's grandfather, uh, Conrad Nix, who was the head coach here in Middle Georgia for a long, long time, won a couple of state titles uh, at Northside High School in Warner Robins. So, uh, you know, th there's, a, there's a strong tie there with Clemson's program, a building tie. We'll see if that tie continues with Tamarion Parker, if Clemson can get him on campus. We always know how that works in Tigers' favor. Uh, that should be the next news that we should keep an eye out for. 6'4", 256, not a bad size for a high school senior and something that certainly Lemansky Hall could work with at defensive end. Well, let's also get into a few small items out of camp, although one that's gaining steam and a lot of people reporting on it is the possibility of Walker Parks changing his role on that offensive line. There's been a lot of talk about this, Bill. I mean, we had heard a little bit about this during the summer uh, that maybe Parks would move inside and play guard. 
Well, then you say, well, okay, if he's going to move inside and play guard, who's going to play tackle? And the the word on the street, at least uh, <laughs> from all the clips and reporters who you and I check out every day, is Blake Miller playing, may possibly playing right tackle, that which would be really interesting to see a true freshman starting at right tackle. We haven't seen that uh, in a couple of years at Clemson. So that would be a big-time development for the offensive line. But we always hear the coaching staff say, we want the five best. And who are the five best? Well, if even if he is a true freshman, if he's one of the five best, he needs to play. That would be a big-time development for this offensive line. And sometimes it's a little more about the drop-off, right? Like, well, if you put Walker Parks at tackle, well, what are you going to see performance-wise at right guard? If you put Parks at guard, what are you going to see at tackle? And who's your more likely successful contributor? You don't want to diminish both of them to make one of them feel better, right? So the coaches know what they're doing. It's an interesting play here. If this is what Thomas Austin believes is right in his first year as the as the offensive line coach, this would be a big-time decision to start a true freshman. That's going to be something that we will need to keep an eye on these last couple of weeks of camp before we get to the opener with Georgia Tech. Another true freshman to keep an eye on is one I've been downplaying a little bit, but it's quarterback Cade Klubnick. Several reports coming out about his arm strength picking up, his effectiveness throwing the football, getting a little better. And I have to admit, he's gaining steam as someone who might be a solid contributor under center. I would think so. If he's ready to play, he's going to play. And does that mean he's the starter? No, because I think DJ has done everything the coaches have asked him to do to be the starter again. And and Dabo even said that again today. He likes what he's seeing from DJ that, that things are progressing well there. But that doesn't mean that that Cade wouldn't play, right? You need him to be able to be ready. Well, how's he going to be ready as a true freshman? He has to get reps. And yeah, we saw him in the spring, Bill. I don't think either quarterback looked great during the spring. I wouldn't even say they looked good during the spring. But you could tell that Cade needed to get bigger. He needed to get stronger. And just a few months, he's done that. And that has to help his confidence that has to help him moving forward. Well, we'll see what that means as far as playing time. But I, I'm i really excited about these two quarterbacks. And it, I really believe that the Tigers are in much better shape at that position than they were this time last year. Some of those quote-unquote sacks that Klubnik ate during the spring game, maybe he would have eluded tackles. I know there was one where Miles Murphy was really closing in on him. And yeah, there was no getting out of that. And you know, the whistle provided a good bit of mercy for Klubnik's health on that play, I'm guessing. But other times he really showed that ability to say, hey, you know what, I'm tucking it. I'm going to go get a couple yards downfield and keep us on sequence rather than risk taking a sack or having to settle for throwing the ball away. I think the thing I wonder about is with these four games, well, definitely the first three, and now with news of Wake Forest quarterback Sam Hartman being out for an indefinite spell, if he misses week four as well, are we going to see one guy prove himself ahead of that NC State game? And I know Dabo Sweeney, if he was going to make a change, would want to do it when DJ Oyungalale could preserve a year, much like he allowed Kelly Bryant to do the same a few years ago. That would be an interesting play and, and to see what would happen there. I, I just don't feel like this is the same kind of situation where – at that point, it looked like Trevor, it was pretty obvious that Trevor Lawrence was the was the guy. And this doesn't feel like that. This, you know, I, I even thought at the start of that season, why isn't Trevor the starter? Uh, but then you saw in the Texas A&M game that that Kelly Bryant was was a better player in that game than Trevor was. So this feels like a much different situation. I still feel like DJ's the best option, and then we'll just have to go from there. One more thing I want to mention, there was a really cool video out there on social media with a couple of new Tigers football graduates academically, cornerback Sheridan Jones and teammate Hamp Green, both summer grads. Jones, of course, is expected to start this year at corner, but the focus for at least a moment was more on the academic side of things at Clemson and a really cool quote from Jeff Davis of Paw Journey, where he said, this is something that we're going to celebrate just like we celebrate victories. And that certainly has been Dabo Sweeney's mantra since taking the helm of the Clemson program. You would hope that that's what every team would do and every school would do. And I, I would think for the most part, these these coaches and these staffs and these schools across the country all do that. But, you know, you, you and I as Clemson graduates, 
this is fun for us to see, and it's exciting for us to see that this is such a big part of it. And it's not just about football. This is about the entire growth of these young men being part of the program and then coming out of the program and being ready to make a big impact on society. So that's a fun part of watching this for sure. Well, we will be keeping an eye on developments on campus in the next few days. We'll react to anything that happens. We'll be sure to discuss what it means for Clemson. Anything in particular you're keeping an eye on? I'm really looking forward to seeing how the basketball team finishes over in France, how that plays out. And, Bill, we're getting close to games. I mean, we really are. With You look at, uh, you look at soccer, men's and women's soccer. The volleyball team is practicing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on on campus. It's not just about football, even though we talk – mostly football on this podcast. There's a lot going on to keep us interested, and I can't wait uh, as we get closer to actual games for all of these teams. Well, I hope everyone has enjoyed this episode. We are glad you found us, Clemson family. Like I said, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that follow button. We're committing to keeping this a free podcast so you won't miss out anytime we react to big news happening around Tiger Town. Our homepage has some good links and an easy-to-read schedule with some kickoff times for the first three weeks, and we'll keep updating those as those are announced throughout the season. Be sure to check that out. That's ClemsonKickoff.com. Follow us on Twitter at Clemson Kickoff, and we're on Facebook at Reign Supreme All Way. So until next time, I'm Bill Zimmerman. I'm Daniel Shirley. Go Tigers. And, oh. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) That was the best analysis of the whole show. (laughs) Don't cut that.